Hello, welcome to the Rook Intro and Ceph Deep Dive. I am Travis Nielsen, one of the Rook maintainers, and I work for Red Hat. So let's get going. All right, for our agenda today, we're going to start off by talking about well, what are the storage challenges that you might have with Kubernetes? Then what is Rook? What is Ceph? Just cover some basics. And then we'll get into the key features of what Rook provides, what new features are in our latest 1.9 release that just came out in April. And we'll get into a demo that Blaine will give. If you have questions, we should have some time at the end to answer some of those. Okay, so what are your storage challenges? Kubernetes really was a platform built to manage short, distributed applications, ideally stateless. And if they need storage, well, storage was kind of an afterthought. There's a way to plug in storage to Kubernetes, but storage is not a native component of, of Kubernetes. So you, if you rely on external storage, it's either not portable, maybe it's a burden to deploy it, if you're in a cloud provider, you know, you're locked into that, that vendor. So how do you get out of that vendor locking? So some of those questions is where we started with Rook and we wanted to really bring storage to Kubernetes in a native way. So that brings us to the question, what really basically does Rook provide? So Rook brings storage inside your Kubernetes cluster and manages it for you. Um, it makes it so your applications can consume storage just like uh, any other Kubernetes storage with storage classes and and persistent volume claims. The way we do this is with Kubernetes, the Kubernetes operator and CRDs. So you tell Rook how you want to manage Ceph and the storage layer, and then Rook will go automate that for you. So Rook will deploy, configure, upgrade Ceph for you. So you don't have to worry about all the details of managing that store, storage layer. Rook is open source, Apache 2.0 license, um, and we just try to have an open community. Uh, we want to do what's best for the community. Uh, as you're getting started with Rook, we wanna make sure you know about all the resources that we have on our website, documentation, you know, join our Slack for questions. At the bottom of the slide, what we wanna point out is we're just starting to release some new training videos. I'm getting started with some basic concepts with Rook uh, on kubebyexample.com. So check it out and I hope it's useful for you. Now, what is Ceph? Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have I've heard of it. Uh, Ceph is an open source fault tolerant storage service. Uh, it provides three types of storage. So block storage, uh, a shared file system where you need to share storage among pods and or an object storage that's S3 compliant. Ceph favors consistency and it was first released in July, 2012. So we're coming up on the 10th anniversary since Ceph has been running in production uh, storage clusters. So we're really excited about that anniversary. So what basic architecture layers does Rook have? So Rook, again, really deploys and manages everything you need for storage with Ceph. So the Ceph CSI driver now, it will you know, provide that plugin layer with Kubernetes so you can provision and mount the Ceph storage into your application pods, just like you do with any other uh, CSI driver. And then Ceph itself provides the data layer. Uh, really, so when you're writing, reading and writing data, it's going to go straight to that, that data layer for optimal performance. So here's a view of what uh, management looks like from Rook's perspective and kind of looking at what pods are created. So there are a lot of pods that need to be created, but again, you don't have to worry about this. Rook creates all of them. So you start with the Rook operator and you tell Rook, I want to deploy Ceph and this is how I want it configured. So then Rook goes and starts the, you know, a Ceph bond pod on each um, of three nodes, then it will go look for all of the devices. So say you have devices on your, your nodes that you just want to consume as storage in your data center. Rook will create OSDs on each of those devices. The OSD is the, the fundamental storage component of Ceph. So all these red pods basically are Ceph daemons and the green pods are really CSI driver pods that help you then provision and attach the storage. So that's in a nutshell, kind of idea of what pods you're going to get with Rook and Ceph. Now, when your application is ready to go consume, provision that storage, we've got uh, this picture here of the three different types of storage. So here on the left, we start with, if your app needs block storage, you're going to create a read write once volume claim you define a storage class, which uses Ceph RBD, and then the CSI driver for Ceph is going to create one of these Ceph RBD volumes and attach it to 
your app, your application pod. Okay, so that's block storage. Now in the middle here, we have an example of file storage where what you're going to do, you've got an application, two applications or two instances of an application that need to share a claim. So you create uh, a claim in read write many mode. Uh, it uses the CephFS storage class, which allows for uh, the sharing of the pod uh, or the volume. And then it mounts it with the CephFS driver. All right, so that's file storage. And then if you have an application that needs to use the object storage REST endpoint with an S3 API, well, we have the, we kind of follow the same pattern that you see with uh, PPCs. So you can create a bucket claim to say, I want a bucket to read and write data to. We define a storage class object, and then we've got a bucket provisioner, then that makes that bucket available to your pod. Now, this is kind of a precursor to the new Kazi implementation that's coming in Kubernetes soon. Uh, so we're looking forward to that, supporting that implementation as well. Uh, now, here's a view of what the data path looks like with Ceph. So this is assuming we've already got the storage provision attached to your pods. Now, when your application is ready to write data, you're, you're going to write to your volume inside the pod, just like you write to any other storage, local storage. That write or read will go through the Ceph RBD kernel driver, which will then talk to the Ceph daemons that are running in your cluster. And you don't need to know anything about where they're running, how they're running. Ceph just takes care of that for you. No matter what type of storage, whether it's the block, file, or object storage with the S3 client, those clients know how to connect to the Ceph storage. Okay, let's get in some of the basic features that Rook brings to the table with Ceph. So first of all, installing Ceph in Kubernetes is, is simple. We've made it as simple. That's been one of our goals from the start of the project, how to make Ceph deployable for the majority of clusters without having too much management overhead. We've got some sample YAML files, some manifests that you just say, go create all of those and we'll create and configure Ceph as desired. The last one is cluster.yaml is the one that's pictured here on the right. That's where you tell Rook what settings you want to deploy with, like how many mons and how to consume the storage that Rook finds on those nodes to create that storage cluster. Okay, we also have Helm charts that make this deployment even simpler for those who are using Helm. All right, so with the CSI driver brings a number of features, uh, standard CSI features. We've got dynamic provisioning for block and file storage. We've got volume expansion, snapshots and clones. And you know, there's this enables all sorts of applications to do failover, uh, work across data centers, work across clusters, mirroring, and a number of scenarios. So what environments can you deploy Rook in? So first of all, primarily where we started was in bare metal. Okay, you've got your own hardware, and on bare metal, you don't even have storage options unless you plug in some external appliance. But if you have your own hardware, you can deploy Rook there to provide that storage platform. Also, if you're running in cloud providers, I mean, cloud providers have limitations in their storage and you can deploy Rook there to also provide a, a consistent storage platform. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So Rook in a cloud environment can overcome shortcomings. So some of those shortcomings include the cloud provider might only limit storage to inside a single availability zone. Well, Rook can span AZs. Failover times can be long in, the, in cloud providers. So you can fail over in seconds instead of minutes. You can have more basically unlimited number of PVs per node instead of you know some product providers might only have a limit of 30 per node. We can also get better performance to cost ratio if you pr provision large PVs from the cloud provider and then you put stuff on top of that, get better performance because of those large underlying PVs from the storage provider. So ultimately, in this environment, also Ceph can use PVCs as the underlying storage. You just tell Rook which storage class you want to provision the storage from. All right now, Rook works well for many cluster topologies. You can tell it to work across zones, across racks, or whatever your data center configuration is, or in the cloud. You can spread the Ceph daemons across failure domains to make sure you don't fail in a single AZ. So even if one AZ goes down, your other two AZs can keep running 
HTTP applications. And you can tell how to deploy based on node affinity, tenancy tolerations, it's very flexible. All right, when you're ready to update Rook or your data layer with Ceph, uh, Rook can handle everything. Rook can update and, and patch all the Ceph daemons to the latest release. Even with Ceph major upgrades, that update is automatic. automatic. Uh, our upgrade guide uh, can look a little scary, kind of a long document, but really it's just trying to be extra careful, make sure you feel confident knowing your cluster is healthy before, during, and after you're upgrading. So another key feature of Rook is that the CSI driver allows you to connect to Ceph that is running external to your Kubernetes cluster. Maybe you already have a Ceph cluster running, or maybe you just really don't want to run your storage on the same hardware with Kubernetes or in the same environment. So you can run Ceph independently, deploy usually with Ceph ADM, and then connect your cluster to that. Uh, I did mention briefly already using buckets with object storage. The OBCs, the object bucket claims, allow you to provision buckets easily. And you know, we're looking forward to the Kazi, the container object storage interface that will be coming uh, with a Kubernetes enhancement soon. All right, so Rook 1.9 was just released in April. Let's talk about some of those new features that are just out. Uh, first of all, Ceph Quincy is the latest major release of Ceph v17. That was just released in April as well uh, on their annual release cycle. So with Quincy uh, comes the latest and greatest storage layer. So we don't get into what those features all are, but Rook does support that latest major release. The CSI driver has, has had some good updates in the 3.6 release that Rook deploys by default. So you can, for example, fuse mount recovery, like we can, it can detect the corruption of Ceph fuse mounts and remount it automatically. Uh, there's AWS KMS encryption and, and many other fixes and updates. Another major feature is NFS provisioning. So uh, NFS is still useful in some scenarios where maybe you're migrating a, a legacy workload uh, into Kubernetes. So you can create NFS exports via PVCs now with the CSI driver. A CSI driver will provision them, and then the Kubernetes NFS will, will mount them for you. And that community NFS driver uh, is available today. And our documentation in Rook explains how to, to work through that and, and get that working. Uh, in this release, we do have a new CRD for creating Rados namespaces. So a Rados namespace is a concept in Ceph that really gives you isolation and multi-tenancy so that you don't need to create separate pools. A pool is kind of a a large entity inside Ceph. And so this yeah, it just gives you isolation within pools. Uh, some network features. So on what happens on the wire with Ceph communication. So you can have encryption on the wire now and compression on the wire as well. They do require a recent kernel 5.11. And then there's much more. Of course, lots of fixes with each, each update to Rook. Emission controller, for example, is enabled by default if we find the CERT manager is available. We support Multis networking now uh, with our latest release and then updated Prometheus alerts and, and much more. To, and those alerts will really help you make sure staff and your storage cluster is healthy. All right, now we'll turn the time over to Blaine for a demo. Thanks, Travis. We also want to show you what it's like to run Rook on an everyday basis. So we have a demo prepared for you. The environment that I'm going to be using for the demo today, I'm running on OpenShift, uh, which is running Kubernetes 1.22. This is on uh, Amazon Web Services. I'm going to have three control nodes for Kubernetes and three worker nodes. Um, I've chosen to use M5.8x large nodes here. Uh, this will allow us to run the final size of the Ceph cluster we're going to get to as well as having about 50% of the node left over for user applications, uh, which is just kind of a rough estimate. I'm gonna be using uh, slow, but pretty uh, cost-effective GP2 volumes. Uh, and this is using what is, uh, at the time I'm recording this, the latest version of Rook, which is 1.9.0, and the pre-release version of Ceph Quincy, which is version 17 of Ceph's release. Before getting into the demo, uh, I want to briefly talk about the two basic types of Rook Ceph clusters that we kind of talk about. Uh, this is um, host-based clusters and PVC-based clusters. 
So for host-based clusters, this is going to, um, Rook is just going to look at the node itself and pick up disks in order to use those for uh, Ceph OSDs. In a PVC-based cluster, uh, we instead instruct Rook to use PVCs. Uh, these might be dynamic from like GP2 today, or these might be local persistent volumes that you've created yourself uh, that represent physical disks on the hardware, but are claimed uh, via Kubernetes native mechanisms. For the host-based cluster, this is suitable for a simple cluster, especially for proof-of-concept clusters. We can say use all nodes, use all devices, and it becomes pretty easy. Um, this starts to get complicated when we don't use all nodes uh, or all devices, uh, when we're using heterogeneous hardware, or if we want to, for whatever reason, customize the device layout on a per node basis. The PVC-based cluster uh, on the surface seems a little more complicated, but we don't need to describe hardware configuration and it becomes pretty easy to expand. We can increase the count of disks that we use for Ceph OSDs, or we can increase the size of those disks um, by increasing the resources that size uh, parameter here in the storage class device set. Jumping straight into the demo, uh, I wanna break it down onto what we're gonna see first. Um, so we're gonna see creating the Rook operator. From there, what it's like to create the, the Rook Ceph cluster. From there, uh, we have something, something we've been working on for a little while and it's a little new for a KubeCon. We're gonna be using a crew plugin uh, that we've created for Rook Ceph to see some of those cluster details. And we're gonna use that throughout the rest of the demo when we expand the Ceph cluster's OSD size, as well as expand the Ceph cluster's uh, OSD count. And uh, for this demo, we're also using recommended configurations for production. Uh, so uh, we'll have these files be provided to you as well so that you can reference what it's like to run a kind of best practice uh, cluster. So first off, uh, we talked about creating the Rook operator. This is really just as simple as creating a deployment, a pod that runs on some Kubernetes node. I've depicted it here on Worker One, although this really might be any available uh, and uh, schedulable worker on your Kubernetes node. Let's jump over to my terminal here and we'll see what it's like to install the operator. The first thing we're gonna wanna do is install some prerequisites. This is going to be CRDs that Rook will use for taking your user configuration about cluster and add-ons, and as well, role-based authentication, which is going to give Rook permissions to create the storage that it needs. Once that's done, we can create the operator itself. Because I'm running an OpenShift, I'm running the OpenShift flavor of this operator, uh, although if you're running a normal Kubernetes, just operator.yaml is the one you want and we'll see that it gets scheduled and it starts running pretty soon after here on the left side. From here, I'm gonna go ahead and start cluster installation. You can see that, uh, that Rook starts scheduling some resources already. This is gonna take about 10 minutes. So while this is running, we're gonna jump back to the presentation. These resources are some ancillary resources to start off with, including the CSI driver, but what I wanna drill down into is really the core Ceph components. Uh, so you can see here spread across our worker nodes, three monitors, three OSDs, and uh, what's called a manager. Um, the monitors are what I like to think of as the brains of the Ceph cluster. The manager provides uh, CLI and API services for the Ceph cluster. And the OSDs are really what provides the backing storage uh, on the nitty gritty details. Uh, the way that this cluster is configured, the monitors should be spread across the nodes and the OSDs should as well. All right, a little over 10 minutes has passed. Most of this time was spent setting up the RIC monitors. This seems to be a, a result of the PVC driver for GP2 being a little slow. So from here, let's look at the crew plugin and how that gets used. 
The first thing being to install the Rookcef crew plugin. So that's crew install Rookcef. I've already got this installed. And from here, um, let's check out some of the some of the commands that we have going in this version. So we have a basic overall Rook status. This is going to show us the status of this uh, Rookcef cluster. We can see that it was created successfully. And we can also see that it's in health warn state right now. So if I suspect something's wrong, I might want to uh, set the Rook log level uh, to debug so I can get more information out of the Rook operator logs. So we can say kubectl rookcef operator set Rook log level to debug. And this will do that for us. Um, I don't really want to run through debugging right now. But we can also run a uh, Ceph command. So we can just say Rook Ceph, Ceph status, and this will give us the overall Ceph status. And we now see the, the health of our cluster is OK. It's just taken an extra minute for the cluster to stabilize and become ready. And in addition here, we see that we have three OSDs that are up and ready. And we have 30 gigabytes of raw capacity. Each of our OSDs is 10 gigabytes. So this is really what we expect. I also want to talk about a Ceph command that's a little bit advanced called Ceph OSD3. Uh, and this is going to show us the hierarchy of Ceph OSDs as Ceph understands it. Um, so we can see that we have OSDs running in one region. This is US West 1. And within this region, we have two zones being uh, West 1B and West 1C. I have two nodes in 1B and one node in 1C. And so the OSDs are spread. Uh, two in 1B and one in 1C here. 30 gigabytes is not really a lot of capacity. This is great for just testing things out, but at some point we definitely want to increase this. We can do that by editing our cluster manifest. And here I'm gonna increase the storage size to 100 gigabytes per each of these three claims. And I'm gonna apply those changes again. And we should see that Rook begins uh, reconciling this change. And in a few minutes, we should have uh, 300 raw gigabytes of storage. So what's happening here visually is just we're increasing the size of these persistent volumes attached to the OSDs. And right now, we're increasing them uh, tenfold. But that could be whatever amount is right for you in your cluster. Jumping back to see what our cluster is doing and skipping a few minutes ahead, we can now see that our OSDs have each reinitialized. And jumping back to our crew plugin, we can get the stuff status. And we should see, and indeed do see, that we have 300 raw gigabytes of capacity. At some point, we will reach the IOPS limit of these GP2 volumes with scale up. Increasing them in size more won't really get us more IOPS. Uh, so we may want to scale out the cluster instead to create more OSDs. And this will effectively allow us to get um, better performance for the size we're increasing. Again, we're going to want to edit the cluster manifest. And here, instead of changing the size, we're going to be changing the count. So I'm going to change this from 3 to 6, which is doubling uh, the number of OSDs and should double the available capacity to 600 gigabytes once I apply this. To look at this visually, uh, we are adding three new OSDs here in blue. And Rook is going to create these uh, and try to spread them evenly across the nodes. So we should see one extra OSD on each node running. Skipping forward a few minutes till when that's done, we can again go back to our crew plugin and see the Ceph status. And we now have six OSDs and 600 gigabytes available. This is also where I'm going to come back to our OSD tree command. And we can see all of these six OSDs. And now there are uh, four OSDs in the zone with two nodes 
and two OSDs in the zone with one node. I do want to make one small note. With this scale out, I talked about potentially doing this per, for performance reasons. Another option is to create a new storage class device set rather than uh, expanding an existing one. With a new storage class device set, I might use a, a different and faster storage like IO2 instead of GP2. And I could provide this uh, as a backing pool for faster storage for some user applications if I have different users that have different storage speed needs. Obviously, the faster storage is going to cost me more, and so I probably want a little bit less of it. Thank you so much. I'll pass it back to Travis to wrap things up. All right, thanks, Blaine, for that demo. Again, we refer you back to all these resources we have for getting started with Rook, the website, the docs. Please join our Slack. It's a, it's a great place for asking questions. Um, or go to our GitHub. Join our community meeting if you have if you want to talk to us over the call. And again, check out our training videos to get started. Thanks for joining.